Hello everyone, my name is Sharon Sherry and I'm here today to speak with Suzanne, Suze Rockman, as part of a romantic rendezvous locked down. Suze, hello to you and thanks for making the time for us today. Well, thank you for having me. It's really a pleasure. I've always wanted to come to Australia and um, now via Zoom I can. <laughs> Excellent, but we'd love to have you here in person. So once the I, pandemic's over, come on down. I hope to someday, yes. All right, before we get into our questions, and I have some reader questions today, which is great. Okay. I want to tell you a little bit about Suze. After childhood plans to become the captain of a starship didn't pan out, Suzanne Brockman took her fascination with military history, her respect for the men and women who serve, her reverence for diversity and her love of storytelling, and explored brave new worlds of best, as a best-selling author, over the past 25 years, she has written more than 55 novels, including her award-winning Troubleshooters series about Navy SEAL heroes and the women and sometimes men who win their hearts. Her personal favourite is the one where her most popular character, gay FBI agent Jules Cassidy, wins his happily ever after and marries the man of his dreams. Called All Through the Night, this was the first mainstream romance novel with a hero and a hero to hit the New York Times hardcover fiction bestseller list. That's a fabulous thing. In 2007, Suze donated all of her earnings from this book in perpetuity to mass equality to help win and preserve equal marriage rights in Massachusetts. She's become widely recognised as one of the leading voices in romantic suspense. Her work has earned her repeated appearances on the USA Today and New York Times bestseller lists, as well as numerous awards, including Romance Writers of America's number one favourite book of the year, three years running, No Mean Feat, two Rita Awards and many Romantic Times Reviewers' Choice Awards. She's married to author and screenwriter Ed Gaffney. She divides her time between Framingham, Massachusetts and Sarasota, Florida. Sounds fabulous. She has two grown children, Melanie and Jason, who amongst other things are also novelists. She has two miniature schnauzers, CK Dexter Haven and Little Joe, both of whom, unlike Mel and Jason, still live at home. In addition to writing books, and this is, I got very excited when I read this, Suze has co-produced several feature length indie movies, the rom-com The Perfect Wedding, which she co-wrote with Ed and Jason, and the upcoming thriller Russian Doll. She's also created a line of MM category romantic comedy novellas called Suzanne Brockman Presents. A firm believer in civil rights for all people, she fought hard to bring equal marriage rights to all citizens of her home state, Massachusetts, and then she moved on to Florida to do the same. Her most favourite thing ever was dancing at Jason's wedding to his husband, Matt, in California in the spring of 2016. And you can find her on Facebook at Suzanne Brockman Books, Twitter at, at Suze Brockman, sign up for her newsletter. It's a great website. There's so much on there. And follow her over at Book Club too. So that's, that's Suze. So a lot happening in your life over the last 25 years or so. Yeah, yeah, and we've actually made two more movies since um, I haven't updated my bio, so we're 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 in the process of of um, of filming a rom com six episode comedy series that was going to stream on De Deku, which is an LGBTQ streaming channel, and um, so we were ready to we were we were a week from production. We and um, when everything went into lockdown and, and you know, we, we, you can't film if you can't be in a room with other people. So, so that project's on hold, but it's, it, so it is, uh, it has been interesting. Yeah. Yeah. That was one of my questions for later. So we'll come back to that because I'd like to explore it. So which of your two towns are you living in at the moment? Right now I'm in Sarasota. We were here for the winter and we got kind of stuck here um, when, when travel became next to impossible. So yeah, so we're, we're in Sarasota. What's the weather like? Very hot, hot and humid. And, and we're, um, we're approaching hurricane season. It starts uh, June 1st and, and it's looking to be kind of a turbulent season this year. So that makes it everything more exciting. <laughs> there might be a novel in there somewhere. <laughs> yeah, maybe. How long have you and Ed been dividing your time between Framingham and Sarasota? Um, well, we, um, we moved down here, we, ha we ha got a, a place down here in 2007, and then we, um, we, we moved our primary residence down here for 2008 for that election, because we figured our vote would, would count more in Florida than in, in Massachusetts. Um, and, uh, but so it's, been, so it's been quite a few years that we've been bouncing back and forth. Excuse me, okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm sorry. How has life been in lockdown for you and uh, Ed and the Schnauzers? 
Well, actually, that we lost the Schnauzers um, last year. Oh, well, yeah, sorry. Dexter. Dexter left us um, in back of. Oh, oh, it was last year sometime. Um, cancer just went really fast through him, and and um, and little Joe, little Joe, we lost um, in. It was last November. So right before it was right before. I got really sick. I'm pretty sure I've had I've had this. I I was I like I had every single symptom of COVID-19 back in um it was uh dis, it was December and January. Um and wow. it it knocked me down for for weeks and weeks and weeks and um and uh uh so but we lost little Joe like almost right before that. And boy is there it's it's a really bad time to be without a dog in a you know locked in, you know like like oh my god. So I'm so I'm really uh, I'm really, I'm, I'm struggling with that. Right. So, but we're doing, we're doing okay. Um, it's, you know, it's really been interesting to watch our friends um, kind of get used to the working at home thing. Um, as a writer, you know, Ed and I, Ed and I both write. So we've been doing the two writers in one house thing for a really long time. And um, so, so that's really normal. The the not going out. We're both pretty high risk. Ed is really high risk. He's a heart patient. And so we've been really taking the, um, you know, the social distancing and the quarantining very seriously. So, you know, deliver, uh, groceries delivered, um, you know, that, that sort of thing. And it is, so it is, it is very isolating and, and, and weird, but, um, have but you we're hanging to, in. Have you been able to see your kids and their families at all or? Just through Zoom, all all through Zoom. My, my parents are uh, my parents are in the like approaching ninety, and um, and they're they're in lockdown too. So we do we do daily Zoom meetings. We have um, we play a game every day at two o'clock, and any any member of the family who wants to come in, we just have an open Zoom room, and um, so we play a lot of like things like categories and um, Pictionary and um, Hangman and you know, just like all kinds of um, of of, uh, of board games. Yahtzee, Yahtzee works well. <laughs> Mm, <laughs> through Zoom. But you're boy. First, you're the first author to tell me that. I think that's a great idea. Keeping three generations all in the one Zoom room and keeping Yeah, and bounce in when you can. It's a, that's the kind of the attitude. And so so it's usually my mother, me and Jason, my my son. And uh, so we're pretty we're the pretty standard regulars. My sister drops in and and uh, Jason's husband because they're they're in lockdown too and and Jason's husband Matt um is works for um for UCLA and he's everything he's doing is is you know so he's in zoom meetings all day so he comes in and he's like another zoom meeting oh no, <laughs> no. there is a bit of fatigue going on isn't there yes isn't there yes but I think they're here to stay I don't think they're going yeah oh yeah there. yeah so our first reader question comes from Suzanne Cass who firstly says I'm a huge fan of yours Suze you started me on my romantic suspense journey my favorite of course is the troubleshooters series her question is, you write in a few different genres, YA, contemporary romance, romantic suspense, etc., and have a couple of larger series. Do your readers follow you and your books across genre or do they tend to stick to one theme or series? I tend to stick to one series um, or, or at least the, 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 the genre. The Navy Seals, like I have two series um, with, that feature Navy Seals and, and there's a lot of cross, crossing with those two series. Um, but, um, but n not so much with, you know, I, I started a, um, a paranormal series and, um, didn't get any traction with it. Um, same thing for the YA books. So it's, it is really, it's a really kind of an interesting thing. And, and I've also found, you know, in terms of, um, the connect, like there's a definite lack of connection between the books and the movies. Um, readers, readers and movie viewers are very different audiences. So we, we've discovered that as well. But, so I mentioned in, in your bio and, and or in your intro, and you mentioned it as well, but you've got a couple of things for screen now. You've got Out of Body, Heading for Cinemas, or that it was Heading for Cinemas. Yeah. Then you've got your indie film, your LGBTQ one, and you've got season one of a six-episode streaming rom-com called Marriage of Inconvenience. What do you want to tell us about those? Uh, well, um, the the out of body we um, we filmed it last year and um, and it's it's it was completely done. We finished um, 
um, post-production, which means that the film is wrapped, it's, it's ready, it's like in the can, they call it. Although in this digital age, you don't put anything in a can anymore, but it's, it is complete. Um, you know, so music, credits, it's all, it's all ready to go. And so we were right on the verge of, um, basically when, when you make an indie movie like, like this, and this was, um, this was an interesting project because it, it's a, it's a, um, it's a, uh, LGBTQ, a, a gay, um, uh, romance that has paranormal elements kind of along the lines of um kind of buffy the vampire slayer type mix of comedy and drama in a in a, a paranormal world that um ha that has a, a distinct set of rules um and um and, and there's so there's two main characters that the, the hero and the other hero and and um and they're they're in a situation where they're kind of locked in together a lot. So when you're making, when you're, when you're writing a, um, a story for a movie, you actually, if, if you're making the movie yourself, you have to consider things like production. You have to consider how much is it going to cost to make the movie and, and you want to keep your budget as low as possible. So, um, so this is where tropes like um, Snowbound in a Cabin or uh, Marriage of Convenience kind of comes in comes in handy because those are stories that that are centered around two people and if you can isolate them in any way then you don't have a cast of thousands every new actor you add every that adds to your production budget um you want to avoid um things exploding or chase scenes or um you know uh, anything with um with weaponry if you like because we we all, we're all um we we're screen actors guild we're the union we work with the union to make our our productions and there's a lot of rules about to protect the actors about having things like weapons on the set so um so you kind of factor that in and um so we wrote this story out of body it was actually a, um, a story that my son jason came up with and um and i had i sat in th with zoom uh, on a, a table read and and of, of an early draft of the script and after it was over i i i called up jason and i said hey would you let me um would you let me like take a pass at the script? Could I could I do a revision because I I think I know where this story needs to go. And um, right now it's a it's a really broad comedy, and I think it has to be more of a romance. Is there's there's really strong romantic elements in here about the, with the two. It's it's kind of it's a friends to lovers story. These two two gay men who've been friends for a dozen years, and now they're finally realizing that that they're the that they're meant to be together. And um, and and I and Jason was like, sure, take a pass at it. Go ahead. And I'm like, no, no, Jason, you need to understand. I want to take a machete to your script. I want to chop it into a million tiny bits, and then I want to piece it together again and really, really focus on the romance. And and uh, and he was like, okay, why don't you do that? And and um and so I I I did, and um and he really loved the script. Um, it came in a little bit long, as, as is my kind of um, MO, um, and we worked on whittling it way down and finally got the script that we were going to, we were going to make into a movie. And, um, and at that point, what I did was I thought, hey, you know what I really want to do? I would like to write the novelization of the movie, because I've, ri I've written now this screenplay, but it really, as I was writing it, I was writing the, the romance novel that was in my head, right? Because I'm a, I'm a novelist. And, and so I... So what I did was I took the script and I wrote the novelization, and then I released it as an ebook, and um, and it actually became a Rita finalist um, last year. Was that last year? It's life has been so, like it's a million years ago. The, whenever the last time that that there were Rita finalists, it was Out of Body was a Rita finalist in the paranormal uh, category, which was which was cool because it was you know an MM story. Um, so, so yeah, so this, so this is a kind of a weird, um, a weird thing. So I wrote the screenplay and then I wrote the book and then we made the movie and the, and, and then we edited the movie and things change as you do an edit. And, um, and, uh, and and we and somewhere down the line, the two Jason is is one of the leads in the story, and his his uh, his co-star, a uh, young man named Kevin Held, um, went into the studio and narrated the audiobook version of it too. So so we have yeah, so it's not, it's it's available in all kinds of formats. But so now we've just we just finished the movie. We were basically with an indie movie. What you do is you take your finished product and you um, you enter film festivals. So there's a lot of LGBTQ, like big, powerful film festivals for 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 LGBTQ um, films, and um, 
one of the big ones is Outfest in Los Angeles, and I think it's Frameline in out at San Francisco. And and so so we had you know you, you get your movie ready and you send it off and you enter it in in a film festival in hopes that it will be a featured. Um, that will be screened as part of the festival. And suddenly we're in this place where festivals aren't, are, you know, there's no live festivals right now. So, it, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a really kind of weird place to be. Like, how, how do we proceed? We, you know, we're, we're, we're talking to, um, uh, you know, there's a lot of, of um, sites like Netflix that are gonna be in, um, in kind of des desperate dire straits for content in, in a, few months and so you know so we're looking to make a contact there with it because what you know kind of like what do you the normal route to to a release of a movie is is kind of is is it we're is all in upheaval right now so um so but that's that's the the movie is the movie is finished it's ready to be seen we just have to figure out how to get it uh get it to an audience and it's really it came out i'm really pleased with how it came out it's it's it's, it's dreadfully romantic and and funny at the same time and and um and exciting and and just and just really uh it's something i'm real proud of so um so yeah so that's that's kind of what i've been that's kind of what i've been focusing on these days and and uh and um it's it's a, it's a really different world than the the publishing world very very different it's one of the few times I've heard of a screenplay becoming a novel rather than the other way around. I don't think I've yeah. heard that often. Yeah, but you know what? I think I've written every single one of my books. I've written the movie that was in my head. So I've always, I, you know, it's always, I've always been focused on the visual. I always see it as, um, it, it, to me, they, they kind of blur. And and so, so in this case, it really, it, it it, it's weird when you when you tell people how the you know the kind of chronology of how the story came to be, but um, but not for me really because I've that's just the way I've always I've always written things like with a with a sense of a real cinema cinematographic cinema what's that word I'm looking for Cine, cinematography cine, cinematic there it is <laughs> cinematic kind of approach to to storytelling. Yeah, another author said that to me the other day. When they write, they see it like a movie reel in their minds. So yep. it's that, yeah. that visualisation, isn't it? Um, yeah. So given all of that, how are you still finding time to write ordinary, ordinary books? And what are you writing now? I, you know, I, it's been a couple of years since I've really been writing, like for so much, for 25 years, I was writing on this mad schedule of, of um, you know, at the at the peak of it i was writing 10 books a year it was you know don't don't try this at home kids it was really insane and i i burned out i mean i've been dealing with burnout for a couple of years now and um i had some health issues and and just the writing just like dribbled to a to a halt i've been um i've been working on the book i'm writing right now is it's the the 13th installment in my tall dark and dangerous series i'm uh it's it's a book called King's Ransom. It's it's um, Thomas King and Tasha Francisco, two two characters who appeared first appeared in the series as children back in you know twenty something years ago when the books first came out, and um, so I'm finally writing their book. But I it's I've been writing it for about three years now, and and it's um, it's just really it's slow going and and um and i keep getting stopped by things like oh a pandemic or you know up or you know um having to move house in the midst of a pandemic and 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 take care of the, the things that i'm taking care of right now um so yeah so you know so i i've i've been i've been i have found that that doing projects like writing a screenplay will it 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 um it allows me to write and it's different and it, I'm, it's something that I'm still learning how to do, which is really intriguing to me. Um, so it is, in a way, it's it kind of, it's kind of like filling the creative well when, when it otherwise feels dry. So, um, so, so, so the, to answer your question, no, I'm, I'm really not finding the time to write the books, but I'm, uh, but I'm, I'm doing these other kind of collaborative projects, which, which is, it's just a really different thing. You know, as a writer, as writers, we, um, we are isolated and alone, like, like we're kind of in, in quarantine. And, and, um, but when you make a movie, you can't, there's no way on earth that I could make a movie by myself. 
and uh, you know and and so i i need the actors and i need the the um the cinematographer and i need the lighting crew and i need all these people who come together and 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 work together to bring this this story to life it's just it's a it's a really um it's such a different form of storytelling than than being a novelist and so so i've found that to just be really um uh invigorating i guess is the word i'm looking for sounds great our next reader question comes from malvina yock who firstly says thank you for all your books suzanne i love them all oh she thank says, you <laughs> she says you always have tough heroes but sometimes you throw in the occasional geek such as the teenagers in the unsung hero which makes mm -hmm. for an incredibly fabulous story what do you like writing the most so i guess that's a trope question possibly um I I like writing stories of redemption. I like characters that um, make mistakes and um, and have to learn and grow and um, and ask for forgiveness. Um, I I love me a good grovel. <laughs> I the last book I wrote, um, Seal Camp, which um, was the it it was the twelfth installment in my Tall, Dark, and Dangerous. A series it, it, I self-published it um, a couple years ago um, has it's all it's all about the grovel with that hero you know he makes he makes a huge mistake and then he has to um, you know really really get into the grovel um, so I do I love that I love writing um, unexpected uh, unexpected kind of relationships like like friendships even and and you know I love writing the Navy SEALs the, the guys who work together in a team, the unexpected friendships that that maybe you wouldn't think would be um, that would that would work, and yet and yet they yet it does. So so that's that's kind of my that's kind of my thing. Uh, I, I noticed when I was looking and researching, you have a lot of titles on Audible. How much control do you have over the narrators, apart from the one that you said Jason was a narrator on? And it's because it's such an important part of the audible experience, liking the narrator. Yes, yes. You know, as soon as I got, um, as soon as I got uh, control of the sub rights of my books, um, and it was that was around. Um, it was with in the Troubleshooter series, um, I believe it was uh, Flashpoint. Um, which is the uh, seventh, sixth, or seventh book in the series. So, so it was. So um, before that, I had I had absolutely no control. And as soon as I did have control, um, I, I talked to um, the audiobook publisher that that I decided to go with. And because um, I had a really strong idea about wh how I wanted the books to be um, to be read, and because I write using deep point of view and with um, with very clear like a deep point of view completely throughout the scene. So so there are deep point of view characters who are basically the the narrator in and throughout the book. And and there there are male characters and there are female characters. And um, and it seemed really clear to me that that um, having a dual narrator, having a both a man and a woman, um, be the narrator from narrators plural for my book would was a was the way to go and um and at that time you didn't see that very often and so i so i pitched the idea to them i i sh I, I basically took the book apart and said here this you know man reads this a woman reads this and here's the here's the pages and the scenes and etc that's how you'd break it down and um and they they liked that idea and um and and then we kind of ran through like uh auditions with with narrators and I got to I got to pick um, and I found um, a, a, an actor he's, he's actually a Shakespearean actor named Patrick Lawler who just absolutely gets my sense of humor he gets my the freight my phrasing he he understands the the musicality of of the of the of the writing and he 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 completely gets my jokes and um and once i found him i did not let him go <laughs> and uh, and then it was a, but then it, the hunt was on to find a um to find a female narrator and um and i had had i had heard, i had had some of my um my books 
be narrated. You know, like they would just show up on the doorstep with, with, I had no control over who the narrators were. And so I had some, I had some ladies um, with like that kind of like round tones, round tones, you know, that, that kind of um, like from singing in the rain with the elocution lesson. And so, and I, and it's like, and like, I, I remember like, uh, listening to the audio, an audio book that just had just appeared on my doorstep. And, um, and, and the, the line in the book was, am I allowed to say um, four letter words in this interview? Gotcha. Fine. Okay, good. <laughs> Cause they tend to come out, but, but the line in the book was something like um, one of the, the characters was going to um, fuck the fuckers first. And, and, um, and this lady with her round tones and, and I, and she said that, and I had to turn off the audio and I was like, I made the nice lady say bad words. And, and it just, it really, it was, it was kind of traumatic. And so, so once I got control, I was like, okay, so I want to find a female narrator who, um, who kind of has a lower voice than the male narrator. I want to, I want somebody who doesn't look like she has like, you know, a matching, she doesn't match her handbag to her shoes who, you know, like she's probably got her hair in a ponytail and she's wearing a t-shirt and jeans, you know, like, can we, can I have, can we find someone like that? And, and the, so the audiobook company is like looking at me like, okay, are you crazy? Like what, what, what do you want? And I'm like, trust me, I'll know it when I hear it. And, um, and we found, um, we found a narrator, Melanie Eubank, who um, who just it was awesome. And then she then she got pregnant, and and we had to find replacements for her. So it was kind of like because she couldn't she couldn't do the job with a newborn. Like why not? But um, but yeah. So once I got control of it of of the audiobooks, I I kind of um, I kind of clung to that. Um, and you had mentioned again what, that we did the audiobook of Out of Body, and um, when. With, with that one, with Jason and his movie co-star reading the two main characters' parts, they actually go into they actually recorded the dialogue in the book as if they as if as if it was conversational. So um, so so that was an, really an interesting tweak to that to the two to the dual narrator that we took with that book. It's it's an awesome audio book of out of body. So if if anybody's looking for something good to read and never listen to the the uh, out of body audio book. I have credit, so I might I might download it today. I know oh, that you also have um, Renee Rodman, who does uh, yes. a lot of Elena. Yes, Elena. Renee was our came came saved the day when Melanie um, when Melanie had to to take care of her baby, and mm -hmm. uh, love I, and her she, she too is an awesome narrator. So yeah, very different voice though. Yes. Okay. Um, which of your books was the hardest to write versus which one was the easiest? Ooh, that's a kind of a hard question. Okay, easiest is easy. Easiest was All Through the Night, which is the book that I wrote. Um, it's um, the the it's it's the the gay wedding. I, I had um, it, it's my it's my holiday novella. For years, it, it's it's a part of the Troubleshooter se series. And for years, um, my publisher was kind of pushing me to um, to do a holiday novella. And and readers too were pushing. They wanted to see a wedding. And, um, and I, and I'm like, okay, well, I don't, you know, that's not really my thing. I'm writing romantic suspense and, and, um, and it's it just, it's just kind of not, it's not kind of what, what I'm, what I like to write. And, and so, um, uh, I was, I was working with Mass Equality to, um, to bring marriage, equal marriage rights to Massachusetts. And, um, and we thought we'd won back in 2007. We thought the fight was over, and and um, and we got a we got a I got a call from the people I, at Mass Equality that I had been working with saying that 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 there was this big push to put marriage rights on the ballot, and and if we did that, it was going to be it, like all this hate would come pouring into the state from out, outside sources, and it was just it was just a we wanted to avoid that at all costs, and we suddenly needed we you know we had been lying on the floor exhausted from the work we'd done and we needed to rally and we needed to to get back up and we needed to raise a crap load of money to to fight this and um and i remember th sitting there thinking you know i have i have made phone call i phone banked i've helped with the canvassing knocking on doors i'm i've so, has held signs on the street and like and like i just can't do that anymore but what i can do is i can write a book and and i thought this is the perfect time to write 
the wedding of Jules Cassidy and, and Robin Chadwick, my, my two gay characters, and, um, and to turn it into a holiday novella and, um, and just and have it be everything that the, you know, that the publisher had been pushing for and, um, and, and give my readers a wedding unlike, one, unlike, unlike any they'd seen before. <laughs> um, because it was really literally right after marriage equality was, had become legal. Uh, equal marriage was legal in, in Massachusetts. So, um, so, I, so I wrote all through the night and I think it took me around four weeks to write. Um, I, I, I went to work each day with a song in my heart and a, and a, and a skip in my step. And, and um, because we had, um, I pitched the idea to, um, to my publisher and I, and I said, and, and oh, by the way, I'm going to donate all the money from this book forever and ever to to mass equality because they need they need this money right now and um and and we got quite a quite a substantial advance and which went to 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 um the organization that um that allowed us to to uh to fend off that ballot initiative and and keep keep equal marriage in massachusetts but um but yeah, so that was the book that was easiest to write because it was my my beloved Jules Cassidy and um, and his and the man of his dreams and and I got to write a church wedding for them. They they got married in, in Boston, so it was set in my hometown in my you know and and it was just it was a really lovely experience. Um, so yeah, no okay. So toughest book, you know, it's the, probably the one I'm writing right now because always the, it's always the book I'm writing right now that's the hardest. Um, or at least that's the way it seems lately. It's a, it seems since the election in 2016. Oh my God, it's so hard. Can I just go back to the book and mass equality? I have to say that's a fabulous way to use your celebrity is to really Thank put you. yourself behind something like that. I admire you. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was, it was a really, it, it just felt really good. It felt so, it felt amazing and, and um, to be doing something and to be able to, to call up, to call them up and say, Hey, look it, here's, here's this, here's this six figure number that's going to be coming to you. And any, as soon as I can get it into your hands and what are we going to do with it? They ended up, they ended up actually um, making a, a series of educational videos and, and, um, and really, really reaching out to the state legislature and 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 changing hearts and minds about about the the idea that they that that you're going to vote to take away their right to get married. Like it just it was it was, mm. but yeah, it was that was it was really cool to be able to do that. So thank you. Right. So not one that you've written, but what is your favorite fictional? Or who is your favorite fictional character? Oh wow! I said, <laughs> "Oh, Spock from Star Trek is my favorite fictional character of all time." I can understand that. I've always been interested in people's journeys and what they did before they became writers. What work did you do before you became a full-time writer? Um, I was a stay-at-home mom. Um, Bef and I did. I before that I did temp work. I um, word processing. Like I can type like ridiculously fast. <laughs> and so I did. I was an office manager at one point. Um, I I I drove and I was an aerobic dance instructor. <laughs> um, I you know I had a lot of jobs like that that were just kind of weird. My sister my sister worked as a maid at this like kind of small town motel and I would I would fill in for her if she did take a day off or something and that was weird that was a that was a really that was a that was it and you know an interesting job to learn how what like hard work is that you know it was very educational with your love for it you never thought about going into the military I actually was um when I was a teenager I thought I would um, become an Air Force pilot, and uh, and that was kind of that was kind of my plan before I realized um, that my eyesight was so terrible. And also, um, this was back in the so this was back in the seventies, and women still hadn't broken that barrier yet. Um, and so it never occurred to me that as, that as a girl I wouldn't be able to do that. But I actually um, I actually joined my local uh, Civil Air Patrol, and and um, and and got to fly in in uh in Cessnas with the with for, for a while I never I never piloted myself but but um 
but that was it. That was just always a dream. I wanted to be an astronaut, really. I was a NASA kid, so. Okay, we're coming to the end of our time. Nope. <laughs> and then I wanted to be a rock star. So. Well, you know, there's still time. What is that? There's still time oh, yeah. to be a rock star. Yeah. Um, we're coming to the end of our time together. It's been just great to spend it with you. But thank you. Um, I'd like to ask you one last question. What's the best reader feedback you've ever had? Oh man, the best reader feedback was um, was I. It was for my book Hot Target. And in Hot Target, I wrote um, that my dedication to the book was it was was a, a letter to J to my son Jason that. Um, and basically in which I outed him as a, as a young gay man to the world and told him that I saw him clearly from as a child and, and wanted him to, and it was so important to me that, that his light w was allowed to shine and he was allowed to be himself. And, um, and I, and, and that, that dedication, um, really reached just struck a lot of readers hearts and and changed a lot of minds too um but i did get a i did get a um an email i got i got so many emails about that dedication but the one that stands out is um is from a uh i think it was a, a father of of who thought that his son was gay and didn't know how to didn't know how to talk to him about it and um and and what he ended up doing was he left hot target open to the dedication on his kitchen counter for his son to find and um oh, it just it just makes me and 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 his son then had a, sat down with him and 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 came out to him like the next day and it was just such a it was just such a lovely just just a just a nice uh connection with with the, the world and with with this kind of understanding that you know love is love and 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 here's here's how we can hear it just it just it just was a lovely thing to hear yeah i, I can certainly appreciate that and that family is probably eternally grateful to you that it could all happen that way yeah it's great it's just it's lovely that's lovely it's made me a little bit teary um so thank you so much for your time today you have a sheet to hold up for us See, this is for the treasure hunters amongst us. Five two no five eight two five six five seven four for Suze Brockman. Thanks, Suze. Sure. Thank you so much for your time today. I really enjoyed meeting you, and uh, I look forward to reading more of your work and to listening to Out of Body. Oh, I think you're going to enjoy it. Let me know what you think. I will. Thank you Thanks. so much. Thanks, Erin. Bye.